Hello viewers! Welcome to a series of videos on building water systems. My name is Caitlin Proctor and I conduct research at Purdue University. This brief presentation is designed to help you better understand what is happening to water as it ages in a building. Before I get started, I want to acknowledge a number of people from different organizations who are working with us on these issues. Thank you to all of our collaborators. Our team at Purdue has been studying drinking water quality for some time. We have multiple studies on water age going currently, including looking at office buildings over the weekend, schools over the summer, and buildings shut down for the COVID-19 pandemic. Multiple resources can be found at plumbingsafety.org. In this video, I'm going to be talking about why and how water ages in a building. After you watch this video, you'll be able to describe a building water system, explain the process of water quality deterioration in stagnant water, including acknowledging the problems that might develop, and you'll be able to outline possible actions to prevent water quality deterioration. You'll be directed to useful resources as well. The water aging process I'm going to describe here affects any kind of building. All buildings that use water have a building water system. Water is of course used in residential systems. We might not think about it quite as much, but water systems also exist in commercial buildings. There are many different kinds of commercial buildings and the size and complexity of the water system will vary greatly in these different buildings. Water can age in any of these systems. Short-term stagnation can happen because of holidays or breaks and can become long-term when we think about summers for schools or off-seasons for event venues. Even if a building has some water use during these periods, it probably doesn't use water quite as often as it does during complete occupancy. Complete shutdown of building water systems can occur when buildings are undergoing construction, renovation, or water shutoff, like if occupants are unable to pay. The COVID-19 pandemic also caused mandatory closures of many buildings across the U.S. in 2020. Building water systems can be quite complex. First, we have to acknowledge that multiple water systems exist in a building. Hot and cold water are usually delivered by different pipes. Recirculation loops are used in some hot water systems to lower the delivery time for hot water. Water of different qualities might also be used. For example, water that has gone through a softener to reduce hardness might be used for drinking fountains to improve the taste. Gray water or rainwater might be used for irrigation. In high rises, pressure tanks might be used to maintain water pressure in those higher floors. Buildings also have other water systems used for heating or for a cooling tower. Many components can be linked to plumbing. You might see some of these and others might exist behind the wall or in the utility room. And finally, many devices can be connected to these water systems. There are so many things that we use water for in our buildings, whether from the tap or from other devices. And we don't just use it for drinking. We also use it for many other activities that can result in water exposure. These systems are quite complex. Fresh water typically enters the building from a buried water distribution system under the street, where a water utility provides fresh water. A pipe called the service line connects the distribution network to the building. When it passes through the water meter, responsibility for pipes and water shifts from the utility to the building owner. Other sources like private wells can also provide water to a building, and there might be extra treatment on site involved. So what does it mean for water to get old? Under normal use conditions, regular water use brings disinfectant residual and corrosion control to the water. Disinfectant residual reduces growth in water, but it disappears over time. Corrosion control measures can also prevent metals in the pipe from going into the water. With normal water use, there might be short periods of stagnation, but fresh water regularly enters the pipe. When water gets older, disinfectant residual and corrosion control measures disappear completely. If water is not refreshed through using the taps or through intentional flushing, growth and corrosion will no longer be controlled. Many problems can develop in plumbing. Metals and sediments can make the water turn colors, yellow or even blue. And we can't usually see this, but there's actually a lot happening along the pipe walls. Metals and sediments can deposit here. Microbes also love to grow along the walls in something that we call a biofilm. 
These can be slimy and actually vary greatly based on the type of pipe, water, and other growth conditions. Those biofilms I talked about love to grow in a few specific places that I'd like to point out. Aerators, which are at the end of most faucets, can collect sediments and create perfect environments for growth. Shower hoses and shower heads have biofilms on the inside, and these have been associated with a few harmful organisms. Treatment devices like softeners and filters can allow for growth, especially if they are not properly maintained. In water heaters and recirculation loops, growth of harmful organisms can occur, especially when temperatures are not sufficiently hot. Some of this growth has been directly linked to disease. When water sits still, the water quality changes could be harmful to health. During short-term stagnation, several harmful constituents have been noted in the water. Many pipes and buildings are made of copper. When copper comes into the water, it can increase to toxic levels. Gastrointestinal distress, with symptoms like nausea and vomiting, can occur. Lead can also increase during stagnation. Lead is particularly harmful to children, where it has been linked to learning disabilities. Organisms harmful to health can grow in old water. Legionella pneumophila is one that gets a lot of attention, but there are many others, including Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Mycobacterium, that can increase during stagnation. Many of these organisms cause an infection in the lung that presents as a pneumonia. Skin, eye, and ear infections can also happen. We don't know exactly how bad these problems could get during long-term stagnation. The organisms we're talking about are actually kind of interesting. They grow naturally in building water systems, often in those slimy biofilms I pointed out earlier. We can be exposed to these organisms in multiple ways. Drinking is actually only a minor route for exposure. We're more worried about inhaling them as they can cause severe lung infections. We're also worried about dermal infections with harmful organisms getting into the eyes, ears, or wounds. Because of these exposure routes, we're particularly worried about non-drinking activities like showering. If the organisms are in the water, they can be aerosolized, and when we shower, we can inhale them, and they can cause a lung infection. We're also vulnerable to dermal exposures at this time. Many other activities can also cause splashing and aerosolization. Not everyone is equally likely to get sick from these organisms. People with compromised immune systems, those who have certain pre-existing conditions, and the elderly are particularly vulnerable to this kind of disease. While all of this can be a little alarming, the good news is that there are many actions one can take to reduce the risks from old water. When water isn't moving naturally because people are using it, if there's low occupancy or even no building inhabitants for some time, some building owners choose to do regular flushing. Flushing, or replacing all the old water in the building with fresh water, accomplishes several goals, but can also be complicated. Other videos in this series directly address those issues. If regular flushing isn't done, or if the plumbing has been left alone for a long time, more actions might be needed. A process that we call recommissioning could be warranted. This includes inspecting equipment to make sure it's still working and completely flushing the building. It could also involve shock disinfection or adding really high concentrations of disinfectant chemical temporarily to kill everything in the system. Testing can also help make sure the water is safe. Testing could be for disinfectant residuals, for heavy metals, or for harmful organisms. Since some building occupants are especially vulnerable, informing everyone about water quality risks will allow them to make their own decisions. Building owners can also continue with several water quality management practices, even during normal water use. Actions like keeping the water moving, keeping appropriate temperatures in hot water systems, and maintaining devices can keep water safe at all times. Thanks for watching. I hope you now understand a little bit more about the water aging process. You should now be able to describe a building water system, explain the process of water quality deterioration in stagnant water, and outline possible actions to prevent this water quality deterioration. 
Finally, I want to leave you with several valuable resources that can help you think about your own building and about how you can provide safe water to all building water users.